Cool. Okay, just to let you know, I'm just recording it right now. Right. Okay, today we are very, very excited to have Susie Samuel. She's a qualified vet and uh, she has been in practice for quite some time, but she has, transit, uh, she has made a transition to running her own business, uh, more online digital helping vets to improve their awareness and her business is called Vet Help Direct. But before we go, go into that, Susie, thank you very much for coming on to the show. I'm very, very pleased to have you here. Thank you for having me, Lennon. I'm, I'm very honoured um, to be here. And, and, and yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. You're very welcome. We are just going to start off with our most straightforward question. Why did you become a vet? Um, I became a vet because I loved animals. Um, I, I grew up with um, family pets. Um, and I was interested in science, so I loved science at school, um, and it just um, became an ambition of mine. Um, and the more that time that I spent in vet practices, um, the more I was sure that it was a, a good career choice for me. When did you start having the interest that you're going to be a vet and hence you know, dedicate your time to vet practices? Um, I was very young, so probably I, I, I was about sort of um, seven or eight when I first decided that I wanted to be a better. So then I would say that that decision, that, that was a very sort of obviously a, a childish idea to become a better. So then um, it was backed up by actually turning out that I really enjoyed science and um, I could see the sort of um, interest of, of, of that in being a vet um, and I, I love working with people so I could see that it was going to be a job where I'd be able to talk to people all day long um, and help them with their animals which seemed pretty perfect to me. Ah, and uh, may I ask which uh, vet college you go to? I went to Cambridge um, so yeah it was, it was a great place to study. Um, I met lots of interesting people whilst I was studying um, and I did a degree in um, pathology pathology in my third year which is one of the um, really good things about studying at Cambridge is you get an extra year um, and I absolutely love that and I think it's sort of given me a, a bit of a different perspective um, on, on veterinary science um, to have studied that. I studied viruses and, and cellular pathology. Let's talk a little bit about uh, vet college. What sort of uh, challenges did you face in vet college? Um, well, I, I guess like everyone, the exams, um, you know, <laughs> are very frequent and uh, the volume of, of things that you have to learn, are, are, you know, are, are quite extreme. Um, like everyone, it was a challenge to get enough practical experience um, because I knew that on day one, um, I knew what it would be like and that I'd be out there um, dealing with people's pets. Um, and, and actually, I worked in farm animals as well um, initially. So I wanted to be as prepared as possible and it wasn't always easy to get enough practical experience and feel as prepared as I would like to have done. Um, and how big was your cohort in your class? Like how, how big was your class? It was about 75 in our, in our year at school. Yeah. And between the first and fifth year, I mean, did all 75 graduate or were there dropouts along the way? I think most people graduated. I think there were a few people that probably decided to choose alternative paths. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe sort of five or six people over the six mm -hmm. years, but in general, we we stayed together and um, yeah, I met some really fantastic people who are yeah really good friends for life. Cool. And uh, when you first started working, uh, how was that like? Um, well, I think like many vets, it was it was a you know a very big uh, um, sort of change from being a vet student. You know, on, on day one, you're there, you're a qualified vet, and all of a sudden, everybody's looking at you. Um, for an answer <laughs> um, so that's quite a, a change um, and then just getting used to working life in general and the sort of organization of that um, I was a farm animal vet initially or, or mainly farm animals so mm -hmm. finding all of the farms being prepared for the visit having everything that you needed in the back of the car and um, these are all really really big challenges and, and then looking confident and being able to make pet owners and, and farmers feel confident in your work and, and I really felt for them and wanted to make sure that I was giving them you know as good a service as they get from any other vets and obviously that's a real challenge when you're a new graduate um, so luckily I had really brilliant colleagues who, who supported me um, and in particular the nursing staff who are just so knowledgeable and experienced and, and they were always there to help and support me so I was very lucky in, in my, my jobs. Mm -hmm. And if you said that there was a uh, one biggest challenge, what would it be in your first job? Um, well, I'm really bad at directions, so I would probably go with finding the farms. <laughs> <laughs> I was always getting lost. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I can appreciate that. I remember my first practice I was uh, in, a, in a mixed practice as well, going to farms for TV testing. And I remember having uh, one of the Devon A to Z. And uh, for that particular book, I actually marked out each farm in a book itself, so they had a directory at the back. So no, well, well, well done. I can uh, totally appreciate that. Um, do you feel, I mean, this, this is something which uh, many people ask really, do you feel vet college has prepared you for working life? Um, to some extent. So I, I feel like it prepared me maybe as much as it could have done in that mm. when I look at all of my colleagues in my year, we were all going off to very different jobs. Um, and you've got to have a lot of background understanding of the science um, behind the veterinary medicine. And then you've got to learn the veterinary medicine. And then you've got to learn the practical applications. And that, that's a huge thing to do that. Mm. Um, and I think realistically, coming out of vet school, you're never going to be a, a fully formed vet. And you're always going to need then that supportive job um, to be able to help and support you. Um, um, and yes, you're in a position to be able to deliver really safe care um, to your patients. But with the backup of your colleagues and, and knowing that you can continue learning from your colleagues i think that's really really important mm -hmm. and um, how did you sort of transit from being a vet to running your current business right now what what made you do the change well i just had an idea for the symptom checker um and i'd had the idea for a couple of years and then i i met some some people um when we were actually surfing on a, on a surfing um trip and they they sort of just gave me the confidence to see that it was a good idea and that there was no real reason why I couldn't do it. Um, so I set up the website that helped direct and um, I just wasn't prepared for the sort of interest that there was in it. We got a lot of press coverage and we were in um, sort of the Times and on Radio 2 and things like that. Um, so I started thinking, actually, I can really see here how this could be really helpful to a lot of pet owners. Um, so I started to devote a bit more time to it. But I just did it in my spare time. Um, so yeah, I'd work sometimes at lunch breaks when I was on call, wow. probably go out. Um, you know, I'm sure you know what it's, it's like, Len, and you're sort of in, in a bit of a sort of limbo. And I'd, I'd just work on the symptom checker then, um, work on the website. Um, and gradually, um, we started to get a lot of interest from other vets as well, um, and it evolved into a business. And about probably six or seven years ago, um, I stopped practicing because it was taking up so much of my time. And although I absolutely love being a vet and I, and I do miss it, um, I love what I'm doing now. And I, I think we're able to help so many more pet owners um, because of the way the internet works. So for the moment, I'm sort of devoting myself to this because I think what I'm doing at the moment will have impact on animal welfare on a bigger scale um, than me just um, seeing a, 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 um, clients every day for the moment. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is very impressive really. So uh, how did you sort of teach yourself? Because obviously you're trained as a vet and in pathology as well. Uh, going digital, like what extra training do you need to have? Do you have to go and learn or courses you to take to teach yourself how to you know, build a a website, so to speak, or build a build a business on digitally on a digital platform. I think it's all just about talking to people, and and I was really lucky that I met somebody um, in Exeter at the time who um, was actually at the start of a journey that turned out to be developing um, his own quite large agency, and he gave me a lot of advice, um, and he built the website for us, and and did it at a fixed cost. All things that sort of helped me get off the ground. Um, and then I just um, learned as I went, really, just throwing myself into it. There's so much resources online to learn about digital. Um, you know, everything's there um, written for you. You've just got to sort of look it up. And I did do a course, um, the Google um, Squared Online Certificate in Digital Marketing, um, about uh, six years ago, um, which I really enjoyed. And it was great to have that learning opportunity and, and meet other people in digital from, from different backgrounds. Um, but no, in, in general, I've just um, learned as I've gone along, really, and from experience. And I think one of the nice things about digital marketing is, is it's like a, another science, really, because um, the, the numbers tell you how you're doing. So you can try something out and, and you soon, soon will learn if it's not working, um, you know, then you don't get the visitors. People stop using your product. Um, and if you do it right, then that improves. Did you find any sort of a um, translation or skills that you have as a vet surgeon in your current business right now that is uh, purely digital? Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the skills I mean, I, uh, that I learned when I was being a vet helped me today. Um, so firstly, communicating with pet owners. And that's what I've always been really passionate about is that side of the job, de dealing with owners 
helping them to feel confident and um, happy, may, helping them to be stakeholders because they know the, the pets the best and they're the best people to make decisions when they've got the right advice from a vet and the right support. Um, so I, I use all of that experience in what I'm doing at the moment because it's not really about the technology, it's about the people that are using the technology and about how the technology communicates with people really. Um, and then I think, like I just said, the science, so the scientific um, training, I think it, it's useful with digital because there's a lot of, you can use the data really powerfully if you choose to. Cool. And um, you mentioned communication. That is really interesting. Uh, did you have communication studies in your vet school? No, we didn't. No, no. We so weren't. how did you excel in that? Was it just part of your personality? Did you take extra courses? Um, yeah. How, how do you get on with customers, like you said? Because um, in, in our college, we didn't really have too much communication studies, really. And that is uh, one thing which sometimes uh, some vets, they do sort of struggle with. So how do you get past that? Well, I mean, you know, you're right. I was, I was learning from square one, really. Um, I really enjoyed it and I was interested in it. So I was always keeping a sort of mental note of um, ways that I'd sort of communicated things to pet owners that had worked really well and um, ways that I hadn't. So I was sort of continually evolving um, from my own experience and, and also from watching other colleagues. Um, so some colleagues, I was just in awe of the way that they sort of explained things to pet owners really simply um, and the way that they made pet owners feel more confident than I was making them feel. And I try and work out why that was um, and then do it a little bit myself. Um, but, you know, recently I have been on some lectures to, about communication and you know, it's a real science and it's so interesting and, and all the little bits of advice that they give you and the ways of using words and things um, can make such a difference. I've, I've also learned a huge amount from Alison Lambert, um, who's a, a huge sort of uh, thought leader in this field and, and the work that her and her team done has, has really changed the whole industry's approach, I think, to client communications. Um, if you felt, uh, or rather, do you think there's something that should be taught in vet college communication? Absolutely, yeah, for sure, because uh, I, I think you could start off on a, at a much better level. There's always going to be some of it that you learn on the job, um, but I think you could definitely make a good start um, um, by learning it at vet school, for sure. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit more about your business. It's very, very interesting. So Vet Help Direct, could you just describe your business a little bit more so that we can understand what is your business about? Um, so we help pet owners um, communicate with their vets. Everything that we do is trying to reduce those barriers so that pet owners can get instant advice and information um, from their veterinary practice. Um, and we do that both giving tools to vets to use with their existing clients, but also to communicate with pet owners that maybe aren't registered with a vet yet or just Googling for information. And then we engage those pet owners and make it easy for them to access local vet care. Um, and we really believe that local vet practices are absolutely crucial. Um, and there's, there's lots of sort of digital innovations out there um, that don't include local veterinary practices. And, and although we've got, there's really like important lessons to learn from them and they're doing really valuable things, actually anything that disintermediates local vet practices, I think ultimately isn't gonna be that helpful for animal welfare because way into the future people are going to need to bring their pets for hand on hands-on care whether it's for treatment diagnosis surgery so if if you're sort of gradually chipping away at that local vet practice maybe that local vet practice ends up slightly worse resourced or slightly further away um, so everything that we do is about empowering local vet practices using digital okay so uh, how would let's uh, let, let's pretend there's uh, somebody who is living in an area who wants to look for a local vet so presumably they'll go online they're going to google if they haven't asked their friends already they're going to google uh, vets near me so how does your platform come into the picture yeah so generally people land on our site through our blog and through our symptom checker or through our fact sheets so people that are searching for information about their pet and we're empowering them to understand um, what they need to do for their pet's condition. Um, we, our philosophy is that people that are looking at things up online want all of the information. So we aim to provide the latest evidence-based information. We don't shy away from giving pet owners any detail because we know that they're really knowledgeable about their own pets and they deserve the best possible information. But we try not to use jargon. We try to make that information really accessible. Um, and then once they've understood and their pet's condition, maybe they've looked at the diagnosis from their own vet, they can then 
take the actions, whether it's communicating again with their own vet or whether it's being put in touch with a local vet practice um, for follow-up treatment. And they're then going to that vet practice knowing that they, their pet needs care, a little bit of understanding behind what it might be, why their pet needs care, and making them really important stakeholders in their pet's mm. healthcare pathway. So presumably for that, you'll be working quite closely with the vet practice that is on your platform as well. Um, have you got any sort of uh, success stories in mind that you can uh, tell me about how a pet owner had a problem looking for a vet through your help and your platform, found a vet that they want, resulting in their problem solved? Well, that's a really good question, Lennon. And what we have is data of, of thousands of pet owners doing that every day. And so we know that every day, thousands of pet owners read our information, and then they then move through our website and uh, look at different vet practices and then click on um, to call one of the vet practices. Um, but we have um, we, we had some case studies early on, but we, we should probably look to try and understand a bit more um, about the people behind it and get some more stories um, coming from, from there. But so that's a good point. Cool. And uh, so you've been doing this particular area of expertise for the last six, seven years. Uh, what, is, what, what is your vision for Vet Help Direct? What, what is the next step? So um, we've just recently merged with VetBooker, which is a client portal that lets pet owners log in and see their own pet's details, keep them up to date um, and uh, see all their vaccination reminders. And it syncs with the vet's computer system, the practice management system. Um, so at the moment, we're very focused on joining all our tools together because we want all of our tools to sync with the vet's computer. Because when pet owners have an interaction with their vet online, Everyone in the vet team needs to know about that interaction when that person comes into the clinic. Mm. And that's what we're really focused on at the moment. Very good. And uh, I presume that is all still local and national base. It's not overseas yet. Um, so we've got a few vet practices in Australia and South Africa, but the majority of vets, you're absolutely right, are in, are in the UK. And we work with over a third of um, British vet practices. Cool. So, and if people want to find out more about whether they're vet practices or you know uh, so practice owners or uh, pet guardians they go to vet help direct that's right dot com Perfect. i'll make sure it is in the show notes that's fine thank you <laughs> um, i'd like to know your so may i ask how long have you been a vet oh gosh <laughs> too too like it's gonna make me seem very old <laughs> too, too long. Okay. um I'll... i've i've been a vet for um 18 years Oh, I'm, I'm pretty much the same, so, <laughs> so not all at all. I have no idea what you're going on about. <laughs> We're all very, very young. Um, very young, I wanted, yeah. I wanted to get a perspective, really. So, um, and the current, currently in the vet sort of profession, um, it will be interesting to see your perspective on that. We have a high depression rate, uh, or rather, you know, they've been talking about that for quite some time already. Every year, vet life, which is the equivalent for the uh, Samaritans, uh, free phone call for, for vets who need help. They say that the numbers of calls have doubled over the last few years, every year. And uh, we also know that there's quite a high level of uh, attrition or dropout. People stop being vets. Uh, there was a report two years ago to say that 38% of vets would actually quit the job if they could afford it. And that's you know more than a third of the uh, profession, really. And uh, the last but not least, uh, another very disturbing sort of uh, stats is uh, on uh, committing suicide. So we have uh, we know that vets they are twice more likely to end their lives compared to the medical profession, and four times more likely than the general public. Um, I just wanted to hear. I, I just wanted to find out your perspective on that. Um, so two questions to that already. One is why do you think that is such, and number two is do you know anyone that has. Uh, uh, that, that falls in any of these categories? Um, uh, it is, isn't it, that there's such a high rate of, um, of, of depression and, and, and suicide in our profession. And um, it's something that, you know, I think needs urgent, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, action, really. Um, and I think that the work um, that Bet Life in particular are doing around it and and actually a lot of the other organizations in the in the veterinary world 
um, is really fantastic. Um, I think there's a lot about being a vet that is very stressful and um, pets are members of the family um, and you know vets are responsible for quite often life and death um, decisions um, and that can be incredibly stressful and, and really take a toll on people. Mm. Um, there's very long hours that people have to work um, and things go wrong however good a vet you are sometimes the animal doesn't recover and sometimes the animal gets worse and that's really really hard um so yeah i i i think it's a, a huge problem i'm i'm you know i'm just you think the work that's being done is is absolutely fantastic um and i'm sort of looking for ways that, that we can um support the profession and i think that um actually there's just being digitally active is quite good for vets. And I think one of the other things that's really upsetting is getting negative reviews when vets get negative reviews. Mm. Um, and what we used to see is vets doing very little about reputation management. So you, you'd just be sitting and waiting for a review. And then what happens is that you get very passionate people leaving reviews. And, and some of those are people that are passionately happy because they've had a really good experience with you. And um, But some of them are the passionately unhappy people where things have gone wrong. Maybe their pet hasn't recovered as the vet would have liked. Mm. And if that's the only reflection that you can see of yourself, it's very dispiriting. Whereas when you start asking everybody that comes in for a review, actually it's brilliant because you suddenly realise that most people are just delighted and happy um, and really grateful for the services that their vet has provided. Um, and uh, it's only a very small minority of people that are unhappy. Um, so I think by being proactive about that, that can be really helpful. Um, and... Uh, yeah, make, make make a real a real difference to how vets feel um, about themselves sometimes. Mm. How if do you think? Okay, if you had a magic wand and is just asking, if you had a magic wand, if something that you can change or multiple things you can change, where do you see how? Where where do you see, what do you think we can do to improve the profession's um, mindset or the way they think or try to re try to reduce all these statistics that we just discussed is that what 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 would be your idea if if any um i'm probably not the best person then really to answer that it's not really my area of expertise to be honest so um, i'm just looking to the people that are leading our profession on that and, and trying to support them as, as best we can because it's not an area i know anything about really yeah fair enough um Another question which you may be able to answer because uh, you're a vet, just like myself. Do you think the profession is uh, profitable? It certainly can be um, profitable, um, but it's, um, I think one of the issues is, is that I think people perceive it to be more profitable than it is. And I think that's because we have so luckily have an NHS in this country where medical care is free and that sometimes it can seem um, like veterinary care should be low cost or free too. Um, and it can be difficult um, when people see exactly how much things cost and they can sometimes assume that the vets are making money. And, and then that feeds into the vet's wellbeing because actually vets are not necessarily particularly well paid compared, compared to other professionals. Um, and so that's one thing, but then having people thinking that they're making lots of money as well um, can be quite difficult for them. And I know, you know that, that's quite upsetting for a lot of people. Um, so, um, but I think, you know, running a vet practice um, and uh, you know, certain, and being a vet, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a reasonable um, salary that's um, gonna keep people comfortable. Um, but it's a, it's a challenge. How, how do you see veterinary medicine? Because veterinary medicine has changed quite a lot since I qualified not so long ago, just like you. Um, and since then it has changed quite a lot. And also back in the nineties, the eighties, the sixties, how do you see veterinary medicine in say about 10, 20 years time? What, what, what do you think is going to happen? Well, that, that's a really good question. One that we spend a lot of time thinking about at, at mm. Vet Help Direct. And um, I think digital is going to be a really big part of how mm. veterinary practice is going to change into the future. Mm. I think being able to access vets easily through messaging, mm. um, a video appointment booking, being able to log in and see all your client details um, is going to be really important because I think a lot more, and I think COVID has shown us this, there's quite a bit of, of what we do that can be done um, online um, rather than people having to come in and which can be really hard for people if they've got mobility issues or young children 
um, or you know, even if they don't drive. Um, so I think digital will become a really increasingly important part of it. Mm. Um, what would your advice be to somebody who is thinking of uh, being a vet and they come, you know, Susie, you're an experienced vet, you, have, you, you were a vet before and were well, still a vet in clinical practice, but you're now transited to your own business as online digital. Um, I would like to be a vet as well. What advice have you got for me? What, what would you say to someone like that? Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful profession. I mean, no, every day is different. You're never going to be bored. Um, you're going to meet a huge array of, of animals. And, and if that's something that you enjoy as much as I do, you know, I think you're going to absolutely love it. However, you do need to be aware of the, the challenges. It's, it's long hours. Um, you know, you could get probably a job with this, the same sort of A-levels. You could end up with a career path that um, was ultimately paid probably better um, and you'll you'll miss weddings and parties because you're on call or, or because you're working um, but having you know having said all those things it, you know the, the positive sides of it can still outweigh that but just make sure for you and your personality um, and what you want out of life that that is the case if you had a chance to go back in the past and speak to a younger version of herself in your 20s what advice would you give to young Susie? Well, I, that's really hard probably the same advice but yeah to, to enjoy it and uh, in, enjoy the pets and their owners and um, uh, yeah I, I've, I've loved being a vet um, and I, I love being involved in the industry I think it's one of the best industries and professions that there is everyone's mm. so lovely and, and you've got leaders and people working in practices and that are equally motivated by animal welfare the well-being of their clients as they are by the bottom line and i don't think there's many industries that you could say that about well thank you very very much susie that was extremely enlightening that was thank very good <laughs>